my name is kishor chandiramani and i welcome you all to the fourth in a series of six sessions on stress management we are going to discuss the physiology of stress and how we can deal with it at the physical level by changing the heart rate variability brain wave pattern and the autonomic nervous system we have briefly touched upon the autonomic nervous system in the previous sessions and today we can delve deeper the autonomic nervous system controls a number of functions such as heart rate skin temperature blood flow and bowel movements which are normally outside our control a discussion of these is important because they are altered in anxiety and a number of other psychiatric disorders and these imbalances can be corrected by means of therapy such as biofeedback and relaxation exercises due to the advancement in technology it has now been possible to accurately measure the parameters such as muscle tension respiratory rate skin temperature heart rate brain wave pattern blood flow in different parts of the body and skin sweat activity which can reflect high anxiety states the biofeedback devices can accurately measure these subtle changes in the physiological functions and convert them into signals and one can visualize their stress scores on the computer and see them return to normal when they relax this is quite empowering for clients who can see for themselves how their stress levels fluctuate with their mental and physical activities the autonomic nervous system consists of two separate systems sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system and these two systems are normally in harmony with each other in anxiety and depressive states this balance is disrupted and there is high levels of sympathetic activity which can be corrected by means of therapy techniques scientists have discovered that the heart rate variability is altered in anxiety and depressive states the rate at which heart beats varies from beat to beat even in healthy states in fact it is considered desirable to have a greater variation in heartbeat as it has been reported that heart rate variability is lower in disease states the heart rate variability is normally controlled by these two pathways sympathetic and parasympathetic when i say my heart beats at the rate of 70 per minute it doesn't mean that it's constantly beating at the rate of 70 that would be quite abnormal the heart is dynamic it can speed up in certain emergency situations and can slow down as well when emergency ceases very much like a child who can be hyperactive and playful and at other times is able to sit at one place for long periods of time Researchers have found that this heart rate variability is being constantly influenced by our respiratory rhythm. When we breathe in, the heart rate goes up. And when we breathe out, the heart rate goes down. And it is related to stimulation of the vagal nerve, which increases the parasympathetic nervous system activity. This influence of the respiratory rhythm on the heart rhythm is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. 
This finding that heart rate changes with respiration has allowed scientists to modify heart rate variability by way of altering the respiratory rhythm. To put it simply, during a panic attack or anxiety attack, if your heart is pounding, you can't ask your heart to slow down. But there is a connection between your heart and your respiration. And your respiration is under your control. By changing your respiration, you can bring about a change in your heart rate. Which means, if you are able to breathe slowly, deeply and using your tummy muscles, you can slow down your heart rhythm and abort a panic attack. Secondly, if you are able to breathe in for a shorter period of time and breathe out for a longer period of time, you can reduce your stress levels and abort a panic attack. In this respect, breath has been described as a royal road to the autonomic nervous system. Breathing is one of the very few functions that are voluntary, that is under our control, and at the same time autonomous. Breathing slowly, that is, at the rate of 5 to 7 breaths per minute, deeply and into our tummy, that is, leading to flattening of the diaphragm, which is the partition between the chest and tummy, has been reported to have a stabilizing effect on the heart and gut movements. Different schools of thought recommend different types of breathing such as paced breathing, abdominal breathing, awareness of breathing, reverse breathing and fast breathing. I'll briefly touch upon three different types of breathing that I normally recommend. Paced breathing, abdominal breathing and awareness of breathing. Paced breathing basically means that you prolong your breathing out. You breathe in for 3 or 4 seconds and breathe out for 6 or 7 seconds. And this is supposed to improve your heart functions and anxiety levels. Second, Abdominal breathing. This type of breathing has its roots in yoga and music traditions. Opera singers are taught how to breathe abdominally and there is some research evidence to suggest that opera singers live longer than an average person. Athletes are also taught how to breathe abdominally in order to increase their stamina for sports activities. With abdominal breathing Instead of expanding one's upper chest during inspiration, clients learn to push the diaphragm down, creating an extra space in their chest for breathing. The individual can see their abdomen rise and fall during respiration, while the upper chest remains relatively still. Abdominal breathing has been found to help those suffering from anxiety, panic attacks, hypertension, irritable bowel syndrome, premenstrual syndromes, fast heart rate, among other things. The third is awareness of breathing, also described as anapana. Awareness of one's own natural breath is an important first step in the practice of vipassana meditation. Unlike the breath regulation techniques such as abdominal breathing, it does not involve any conscious effort to change the pattern of one's normal breathing. The individual simply observes the natural flow of one's respiration and treats his thoughts and emotions as a background noise. This form of breathing can be seen as a form of biofeedback wherein 
the individual becomes aware of the abdominal pattern of breathing such as hyperventilation breath holding sighing a simple awareness of the abnormal pattern can result in resumption of the normal pattern i'll come back to anapana a little later when discussing attention regulation in this session the other important parameter that is involved in stress and can be altered is a brain wave pattern there are four different types of brain waves alpha beta theta and delta each with its own function alpha waves have a frequency of 12 hertz per second and they are supposed to produce tranquility and relaxation in the mind beta waves are supposed to have a stimulant effect on the mind and their frequency ranges from 13 to 30 hertz per second theta waves with frequency between 4 and 8 hertz per second are supposed to be involved in learning new skills memory and other cognitive functions and delta waves with frequency of 1 to 3 hertz per second are supposed to be involved in deep sleep and meditative states it has been reported that in certain psychiatric disorders such as anxiety alcohol dependence and addiction to sedative drugs such as heroin benzos and opiates the brain is over aroused and use of alcohol or sedatives lead to a reduced level of arousal that is individual brings their arousal level to an optimal level which produces a sense of comfort whereas individuals who suffer from attention deficit and hyperkinetic disorder and who abuse stimulants such as cocaine and amphetamine have under aroused brains and increased physical activity or the use of stimulants lifts their arousal to an optimal level which is again relaxing for them it is possible to alter the brain wave pattern and arousal levels of the individual with the use of biofeedback devices such as light and sound machines they can produce increased alpha or beta activity thereby bringing the arousal of the individual's brain to an optimal level these biofeedback therapies also open up the door for enhancing one's memory and learning skills by way of producing more of theta waves there's also research evidence showing biofeedback therapy works for epilepsy chronic fatigue syndrome and disorders such as tension headache and migraines irritable bowel syndrome hypertension among other disorders there is a biofeedback device called stress eraser which helps individuals increase their heart rate variability by way of manipulating their respiration in such a way that it comes in sync with their heart rhythms If you're listening to this session as part of the therapy program at the clinic the facilitator will introduce you to these biofeedback devices After autonomic nervous system the second broad topic for today is attention regulation Different therapies place different emphasis on different aspects of mental functions Some therapies focus on the thoughts with the understanding that if one can change one's thoughts then the behavior and the emotions are automatically altered whereas other therapies place a greater emphasis on emotions and behavior This stress program places emphasis on learning a number of different ways in which 
one can stop forming new negative experiences this opens the door for the old emotions to get worked on and attention regulation is one of the key techniques involved every thought and every emotion dies its natural death if we don't pay attention to it it's the attention that fuels the fire attention regulation is a very simple technique but one that has to be practiced constantly for a sufficient period of time the first and the foremost approach to attention regulation is to shift one's attention from the thoughts of the past or future to that of the present if we look carefully we find that whenever we get stressed mostly we are either thinking about something which happened in the past that is a few minutes hours days or months ago or something that is going to happen in the next few hours days or months if we live mostly in the present we can cut through a lot of stress we need to be mindful of the past and we need to plan for the future as well but that should not require more than 10 to 20% of our time and energy but unfortunately that takes a lot of our time with the result that very little time and energy is left to deal with the present whenever we think about the past we are either left with a sense of loss or separation if you are thinking of the good old times or we are filled with unpleasant and bad memories if you are thinking about a difficult past either way it increases stress it is therefore recommended that the past should be understood in terms of historical inevitability that means it had to happen that way it could not have happened any other way even if i had acted differently or that was my destiny because the past can't be undone thinking about the past is recommended only for short periods of time and for specific purposes when we want to dwell on certain pleasant memories of the past in order to help ourselves pull out of the negative emotions but spending too much time with the past memories of good times as well may interfere with everyday activities and will impair our ability to deal with the problems at hand according to certain eastern approaches the past should be seen as a dream a mixed dream of good and bad which does not have any real consequences now and in many ways might have become irrelevant on the other hand looking into the future can also increase stress in a number of different ways it can either create a sense of insecurity or an illusion insecurity is whatever we have got today may not have it tomorrow a secure future is guaranteed to no one no matter how important the person is on the other hand it can create illusions when one starts dreaming about the future and starts building castles in imagination this also interferes with one's engagement with the present activities tomorrow is the child of today and if we have sorted our today a tomorrow is already sorted all this discussion does not mean that one will not plan for the future or learn from the past that is absolutely essential but it shouldn't take more than 10 to 20% of one's time and energy unfortunately we tend to overdo it if that is so then the effort should be on cutting it down by switching our attention to the present 
so in practical terms whenever you catch yourself thinking about the past or the future you need to come back to the present and ask yourself what are the pending tasks for today and how to do them better this will help us deal with the stress related to jobs that are yet to be done the second attentional shift that is required is from one's preoccupation with the results of one's action to successful completion of the tasks at hand results depend upon a lot of other factors like people their personalities their thinking pattern dwelling too much on the results is like playing a game with eyes constantly on the scoreboard and not on the ball the goal of any action should be successful completion of the tasks rather than insisting that the outcomes match our expectations of course one has to be mindful of the results because a feedback is needed for action to be modified but a constant preoccupation with the result would be unhelpful attentional shift is also required from one's own thoughts and emotions to that of perception sometimes problems of thinking can't be solved by thinking more one has to step outside one's thought process or emotions and switching from a thinking to a non-thinking mode can be helpful a little zen story here to explain this point there was a zen master who instructed his three disciples not to utter a single word from henceforth immediately the first disciple says okay sir i'll not speak the second disciple says to the first one how stupid you are why did you speak and the third one says sir i am the only one who has not spoken switching our attention from thoughts to non thinking processes can reduce our stress if the thoughts are troubling for switching attention from thoughts to perception one has to focus on the five senses without making any judgment an example looking at the clouds or a flower or a butterfly or objects around us and paying attention to the minute details of the texture the color the pattern can be a relaxing experience another example looking at the desk in front of you you can notice the color of the wood the grain the pattern without making a judgment whether it's a good table or a bad table can be helpful this basically means that one starts noticing things more in the surrounding rather than thinking all the time finally the attention shift can involve switching from other people's actions to one's own actions we don't live in a perfect world and we are surrounded by people who fall short of our expectations they are following their own agenda and usually look after their own interests first a constant preoccupation with the actions of people around us can create stress and therefore shifting one's attention from their actions to what one can do to deal with the situation better can be helpful one can argue that without paying attention to others actions how can we live properly fair enough but the problem is that we overdo it and we remain preoccupied with others actions to the point that it increases our own stress levels my guess is that in spite of our efforts to switch attention from others actions to our own actions we'll still be mindful of their actions in order for us to deal effectively with the situation to give an example 
I saw a client who was constantly preoccupied with his adolescent son's behavior. His son was leaving his room untidy, was misbehaving, shouting, slamming the doors, and probably abusing illicit drugs. And my client was constantly trying to control his behavior, which was becoming counterproductive. During therapy, he understood that maybe his son was 90% wrong and 10% right. And he himself was 90% right and 10% wrong. But by shifting his attention from his son's 90% wrong to his own 10% wrong, he was able to bring a change in his son's behavior simply by working on his 10% which was going wrong. Now moving on to some of the relaxation methods that I have not covered so far. Number 1 Jacobson Progressive Muscle Relaxation and number 2 Guided Imagery. It has been found that when we get stressed, the muscles become tense and when we are mentally relaxed, the body muscles also relax. So the increased muscle tension is a manifestation of high anxiety. Simply trying to relax our muscles is not going to reduce the anxiety because it's the anxiety that leads to increased muscle tension and not the other way around. So how does muscle relaxation help with anxiety? With Jacobson progressive muscle relaxation, one gradually learns to tighten the muscles, feel the tension and gradually relaxes each and every muscle of the body and experiences the relaxed state. The emphasis during this procedure is not to relax the muscles directly but doing something mentally which will lead to muscle relaxation. And this exercise involves some amount of mental switching in order to bring about a state of physical relaxation. The second relaxation therapy approach is called guided imagery. With guided imagery, one creates a mental image of a positive experience, either a new one or something that one has experienced in the past. And by keeping one's eyes closed, one learns to recreate that positive experience vividly through the five senses. And due to a connection between the mind and one's physiology, one can see changes happening in the physiology the moment one starts to bring those positive images in one's mind. Clients can practice this by assuming a relaxed posture with the eyes closed and trying to remember things from their past when they had a blissful experience and trying to recreate that experience in their imagination. Researchers have found that one's physiology changes by practicing this for about 15 to 20 minutes the heart rate and respiration slow down, skin temperature goes up, muscles are relaxed, there are more alpha waves produced in the brain which are indicative of tranquility and the whole experience is health promoting. It's important to understand here that when we are creating a new positive emotion the task of undoing a negative emotion stops immediately. Because negative emotions have to be dealt with on their own terms and creating a positive experience can't undo the negative. But it is also important to create positive emotions which gives us strength to deal with the negative emotion. So in this session we have looked at the physiology of stress and how we can deal with it at the physical level. In the next session 
we'll try to understand the different psychiatric syndromes and stress management in the light of knowledge from existentialism which is a branch of philosophy and psychoanalysis thank you very much <music>